Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Digital Charcuterie. My name is Andrew Fantasia. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk some more DC Superheroes United today because uh, bombshell after bombshell was a thing in this campaign. And we just I, I got to go over it with you. It's just it's it's too much fun not to. You know, if you like us, click the bell, click the thumb, click the subscribe. Just do lots of clicking to show your support and love and all that YouTube jazz. And also, uh, maybe click your way to Amazon while you're at it, if you're a fantasy fan, because I am a fantasy fan so much so that I wrote these. I wrote these fantasy novels right here. My series is called We Were Wizards, and they're uh, just a fun swashbuckling adventure with magic swords and boomerangs and, and talking trees and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, I might have spoiled a few things there just now, so forget I said a couple of those things. Uh, but you can check out We Were Wizards right now on Amazon. It's in hardcover, paperback, and ebook, whichever you prefer. So let's jump together onto the campaign page and take a look at what was revealed on Wednesday, July 17th. Well, right off the bat, Captain Cold is welcomed into the Captain Fold. Uh, I'm very happy that the rogues are here. This is just magnificent. So that can be scrolled past now because that is complete. And then we get to this holy play mat. And we're going to take a look at this right here. Let me just open it up. Ba -pow. All right. So the play mat is here. And man, did they ever get creative with this thing. Uh, j just with the color scheme, at least. Uh, it's still the same old playmat if you have the one from Marvel United Season 2, which I think in most people's opinion was the definitive playmat for Marvel. Uh, this one is singing to the same tune there. Uh, so as we scooch down this way, it's 90 centimeters in diameter, so I think it's the same as the Season 2 one. The Season 3 one was shorter. I totally get it. People have smaller spaces, they want a shorter thing so that they can kind of just fit it in and then do their, their uh, storyline their own way. That is absolutely 100% okay uh, to have that option. I think that was really cool of Simon to give that option to. So this one here is the double-sided one. And just like before, it's got a side for if there's multiple people sitting around the table. And a side for if you're playing solo or if everybody's being weird and just sitting on the same side of the table. But hey, you do you. I mean, first of all, if you are not familiar with the map from the last, uh, from Marvel at least, um, this just helps you organize, as it says here, your play area. So instead of just reading verbatim what they say here, let me give you basically the personal gist of this. So these big spaces here, uh, if you are unfamiliar, those would house all of your locations, as well as these blue spaces for the threat cards. Then up here, you have the villain dashboard and the three mission cards. They give you space for the master plan deck here, and then some little nooks and crannies for the tokens and whatnot. And over here, on the outside, is your storyline where you would place card after card in a nice, tight, organized little circle around everything. And these are laid out uh, to face outward. So if you have, let's say, six people sitting around a round table, everybody has at least one location that is facing them head on. So it spreads the love. It's evenly distributed. And if you're wondering if it's worth the buy, in my opinion, yes. I was fortunate enough that my best friend uh, gifted me the mat because he found it at retail. Uh, he came over, he played Marvel United with me once, and I didn't have the mat. And he was like, oh, this is a great game. And he saw how into it I was, so he went out and bought me the mat for my birthday. So uh, I was very fortunate in that regard, and now I couldn't imagine playing without it. It just makes everything so much more beautiful. It amplifies the table presence of the game and just makes it easy all to lay out, especially that storyline. That storyline can get a little finicky. Um, but that is the, the side for people sitting around the table, and it is colored to match Wonder Woman and Superman's color schemes with the red, the blue, and the gold, because those two like to work together and be part of a team. But a hero who is much more comfortable flying solo is Batman, and the solo side of the DC United board is Batman themed, right? That is just so on brand, well done. And again, if you're not familiar with these, you'll see the difference here. Like I said, all the locations in this one are spread out facing outward so that every player around the table can see one head on, at least one. 
The solo one, meanwhile, all the locations are upright facing you. I love it. It's fantastic. Whoever came up with these color schemes was a genius. Uh, but yeah, that's the mat. So really nothing more to say about that. And the, uh, the mat is an additional buy that you can get. And then as we go up here to our next hero that was unlocked uh, yesterday on Tuesday night, Etrigan the Demon. Etrigan was a guy who had a spell cast on him, I think, or a curse or something, and uh, now he turns into a demon and he speaks in rhyme. That's right, Morgan Le Fay and Merlin were part of his crew. He used to roll with them. My man goes back, way back, and his miniature looks outstanding. Just very, very cool, just standing on the rock, all the the little details on his, his wristband there and his fins and horns. Card colors are perfect. And you'll notice his card names also rhyme because he speaks in rhyme. I am healing, you'll soon be kneeling. Right? That's so cool. What a nice little touch. What does this say here? If you have less than three cards in hand at the beginning of the villain turn, you may draw a card. Lots of healing. I mean, that when that first Wolverine card showed up and allowed us to heal, I think they knew they had a good mechanic on their hands because they rolled with it. Summoned by Jason Blood, Etrigan the Demon is constantly healing himself, so he won't easily go back to where he came. His dark magic is capable of relocating anything around him, from thugs and civilians to heroes, villains, and even threats. His powerful hellfire attacks not only deal a devastating blow to his enemies, but they can set them ablaze. So they'll continue taking damage for a while. That's so sweet. Again, this is another character that is totally somebody I would not have expected to be in a season one. But they are really shoving aside all preconceptions for this season and just doing some shocking things as we will see coming up next and after that as well. But that's Etrigan the Demon. And eventually he was unlocked. And last night I was minding my own business when I got a message in my email saying that Etrigan was unlocked and I thought, oh cool, who on earth is the villain now who is next in the queue? And that answer made me gasp. I saw this right here, the Monarch of Mayo. And at first I saw the word Monarch and I thought, oh, the DC villain Monarch. He's like a time traveler and he goes and takes over the world in the future. He's kind of like King the Conqueror. But then I saw the word Mayo. Once I saw the word mayo, I realized what we were in for, and oh my god, look at him. It's the Condiment King. We are looking at a chibi Edouard Guiton style art piece for a United Condiment King. I Somebody pinch me. I think I'm dreaming. I, I can't believe this is real. And I'm sure a lot of people felt the same way. Mitchell Mayo, I mean, he was already halfway there with the name. Uh, <laughs> this guy is in the game. I, I can't believe it. And there he is. There's his figure. He's got the guns. He's He's got the little pickle thing on his head. Uh, and he comes with these stain tokens. Isn't that great? And his dashboard is beautiful. All right. So what do they say about him? Okay, so in all honesty, Condiment King doesn't pose a real threat to any self-respecting hero. However, a self-respecting hero would be embarrassed or at least considerably annoyed to be seen with their cool costume all stained with ketchup and mustard. That's the chink in the armor that the dastardly Condiment King will exploit. He walks around, firing his condiment gun at heroes anywhere near him, attaching stain tokens to them. It takes a hero until the end of their turn to properly wash their outfit. Until then, they're not in a presentable state to be able to rescue respectable civilians. If overflows happen, cards are removed from the master plan deck, even more so if there's a humiliated stained hero in the overflow location. Condiment King's threats arm him with ever more potent condiments, from hot sauce to very hot sauce, all the way to extremely hot sauce, each of them requiring an increasing amount of violence to wash off. Stained heroes on these threats are so discombobulated that they must play their card randomly, and when Condiment King dials up the hotness once under pressure, they'll simply play their card face down as they rush to find some milk. I think we have the equivalent of Bob the Hydra Agent. It, <laughs> isn't this magnificent? Okay, first of all, something people might not know about me is I am a connoisseur. If it, no, that sounds pretentious, but I am a big fan of hot sauce. I love hot sauces. I'm not necessarily a kind of guy who would say the hotter the better, because I don't think that's the case. I think the tastier the better, right? That makes more sense. You, you want to be able to enjoy what you're tasting, and if it's too hot, then you're not. So I'm constantly on a quest to find the perfect balance of hot and tasty. So I'm a hot sauce guy. 
and the fact that Condiment King's threats are all hot sauce related. Oh, that makes me so happy. It says here, his special rules are heroes starting their turn with a stain token can't rescue civilians. Then they discard the stain token at the end of that turn. And his BAM, um, it's covered up, but it looks like he gives one stain token to a hero that doesn't have one in Condiment King's location and each adjacent location. I'm just guessing that based on the words we can see there. So he's just going to stain their clothes. Just think about that. Think of the most malign, gritty, unhappy heroes you can think of. People like the Punisher and what have you. And picture just Condiment King running around squirting them with mayonnaise and mustard. <laughs> this is the greatest board game ever made. And again, not a season one villain I would have expected. I don't even remember if I put him in my DC United hypothetical thing. I think I opted out because I was like, there's no way. But then here we are. We have a fully drawn painted Condiment King with this dashboard with these stain tokens life is good so that is that and he took a while to unlock because there was a big stretch gap uh to get to him he was the one that would have gotten us over the one million mark in fact um but he was helped along the way by wednesday's biggest uh announcement what i really want to spend the bulk of my time talking about today and that is this right here the green lantern core I am not alone in this, but the Lantern Spectrum is probably my favorite pocket of all of DC Comics. The idea of all these multicolored Lantern characters doing their own things and interacting with each other is just visually and thematically pleasing to me. So I'm a big, big Green Lantern guy, and I've been looking forward to this, and I know a lot of people have, and I know Simon knows that a lot of people have because they've been building up the Green Lanterns. They've been saving it. They've been holding back on two things, Green Lanterns and Batman villains. Think about that. The hype for Green Lantern characters is being given equal treatment to the hype that normally goes with Batman villains. That's how big a deal Green Lantern is. So we have this box and there are a couple things I missed at first because I was so excited to see it. But as we scroll down here, um, we'll talk about those things in a second, but we take a look at what we have in the box itself, and we have five heroes. So Guy Gardner, Jessica Cruz, Kilowog, Salak, and Jon Stewart. And let me just go for the record here and state how happy this makes me, because those last three, Kilowog, Salak, Jon Stewart, those are my three favorite Green Lantern characters. Actually, let me rephrase that. Those are my three favorite Green Lanterns, because Sinestro is probably one of my favorite Green Lantern characters. In terms of the GL core itself, those three are my favorite, and they are all in one box. I I am floored. Jessica Cruz, I have not read any of her stuff, but she seems awesome. Guy Gardner is a jerk, but in the most wonderful way. They gave him a baseball bat. Totally fitting. But my god, I can't believe it's real. We're actually seeing United Green Lanterns. They... Put the effort into their cards. Their cards are still colorful. It's not all just green, 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 green. Like there's actually some thought put into it. And we're seeing our first taste of the translucent green effects on the miniatures, which we all kind of hoped and knew was coming. But seeing it, uh, that's a whole other level. So for $30, this crowdfunding exclusive character pack brings the awesome power of the Green Lantern Corps to DC Super Heroes United. This cosmic team relies as much on each other as they do to the power of their will, channeled through their green power rings to perform impossible feats. Each of these heroes features a unique green clear part in their figure to represent their Green Lantern powers. United, the Green Lanterns are ready to defend all corners of the galaxy from evil. And as we see here, it's got all the cards and the figures, as well as some equipment, which we see right here, the Green Power rings. Now everybody in this box is getting a green power ring equipment card and it looks like they all work exactly the same. And this is a game changer right here. It says here each hero in this set has their own power ring equipment card which works in conjunction with their deck. Many of their hero cards display one of the action symbols at the bottom as a green symbol. And we can see that right here. Kilowog has a green heroic right there. It's even got the little lantern symbol. And even this move is not a typical move even though moves are always green. Look at that. It's special. It's different. So it says, while these work as normal action symbols, they also have a special interaction with green power rings. When using their power ring, the hero is able to perform two additional times the action corresponding to a green symbol on their own played card. 
or the previous hero card in the storyline. So even more than usual, cooperation is key for the Green Lantern Corps to take full advantage of their power rings. Two additional times. That means if you play this Kilowog card right here with this green arrow and use your power ring to enhance it, that gives you three moves and a wild. And if the player before you is using a Green Lantern character and they had a green thing and you flip the ring during this turn, you could potentially combo so many things. You could be doing seven, eight, maybe even nine actions on a turn. I That's unbelievably powerful. Thankfully, it's not overpowered because, you know, once you use this ring, you gotta flip it. But it says here you can recharge a used power ring. It's costly, it guys. Two action tokens, but every hero also has a couple hero cards that allow them to recite the Green Lantern Oath, which charges the ring, which is the most thematic thing in the world. They nailed it. They nailed the Green Lanterns. I bet you they were stewing on these guys for a while to make them special, and boy, does it look like they ever succeeded. So here's Jon Stewart. Here are his cards. It's the most beautiful dual shade of green you could imagine for his cards. I think that's the exact same shade of, like, deep, dark emerald green that he wore in the Justice League cartoon, which is perfect. And there's his ring. And look at that leadership card. Another hero can immediately perform a wild. Outstanding. We're not going to read all of the stuff here because I do want to spend most of the time today focusing on sort of the bigger um, reveal here. But there's my boy Kilowog, probably my favorite member of the core. I love Kilowog so much. And we get another great set of cards for him. He can gain tokens, it looks like. Uh, there's his reciting the oath card that'll allow him to charge his ring. Next is Jessica Cruz. I really want to read Jessica Cruz's stuff. She's from the newer comics and I have not caught up to there yet. In my Green Lantern reading, I'm still only, uh, oh boy, maybe at the beginning of Rebirth, like right before Rebirth started. So I, I have not touched any of her stuff yet. But she seems really, really cool. She's got that axe, too. Okay, so she can create a force field. During the next villain turn, one hero in your location may ignore the first damage they would take. Stupendous. And she's got one of those green symbols. This is so awesome. And we have not had nearly enough United Minis wielding axes. So I'm glad they stepped up their axe game here. And there's Guy Gardner stepping up their baseball bat game. Guy Gardner is a loudmouth foul-mouthed jerk. Uh, that's what he's known for. And he's very hot-headed. He's always just, you know, hey, let's get into a fight. Hey, them's fighting words. Hey, come over here. I'll prove to you that I'm the best. And then he just punches people like he's, he is, uh, he needs help. <laughs> but uh, there he is swinging his bat. He's a big fan of, uh, I believe, the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah, he was born in Baltimore, so he uh, he's an Orioles guy. Uh, I mean, all the comics that I have with G Guy Gardner, he's always talking about baseball. It's like, hey, did you see that Orioles game? It was a real uh, real nail bite of that game. Uh, you can see back there, there's a card with rage on it and a couple punches, because as it describes him here, his inner rage can come in handy when violence is the best solution. The free attacks it grants him are multiplied if he is wounded, increasing his rage. Perfectly thematic. If he's hurt, he's going to get angry. That's how Guy Gardner rolls. Uh, and then last but not least, Salak. Man, this guy is like, how do I even describe him? He's he's like the Kiadi Mundi of the Green Lantern Corps, and that is a deep cut Star Wars reference, but he's just sort of there at the core, uh, watching over things. He kind of usually stays in the headquarters and uh, runs things from like the library, but you don't mess with him. He's not a pushover. And, you know, if uh, the, the core is ever threatened, uh, which they are regularly, Salak is the first one to step up and be like, uh, get out of my library, sir. The, he, yes, he's the keeper of the Book of Oa. And man, his cards look great. Look at all of that. And so he has this keeper of the book card. Gain one heroic token, or if you didn't use your Book of Oa equipment this turn, recharge it at the end of your turn. So he has a second equipment, the Book of Oa, as well as his ring. And he can use this on his turn for this effect. Another hero with a face-up green power ring equipment in your location may move then wild. So it's a very specific one. It's got to be used on your turn to affect another hero who has to be in your location and they have to have a face-up green power ring equipment. So the, the game really is relying on you to use not just the equipment cards often, but the teams often in tandem to maximize the, the synergy of your characters, I guess, which is tricky for me, a randomizer that I am, but I'm sure there's ways to, uh, to home, 
home rule, house rule this. That's the term I'm looking for to house rule this so that it's a little less specific. And then they give you a Green Lantern Corps team deck. And I'm going to be honest, ever since the team decks were first introduced in the multiverse season, I have been dreaming of seeing an all green backed team deck with the Green Lantern Corps on it. And my dream has just come true. What an awesome sight this is. It looks like all the cards are quotes from their oath, which is so clever. And the bad card is from the In Blackest Night part, and it makes Power Rings and Reciting the Oath useless. There's not enough applause in the world for how I feel about what they did with these Green Lanterns here. But here's where I want to kind of start chewing on some things here. First things first, look at this box. This is a rectangle. And it took me a while to notice that, but yeah, this box is a rectangle. It's not a square like every other United box has been. And then to top it all off, we scooch back up here. Sorry if this is making you nauseous as I... Uh, Scroll all the way up here. Just close your eyes or grab some Dramamine. I'll be done soon. And almost done. Here we go. All right. Green Lantern Core character pack. And I missed that at first. I had to see it in the comments and realize, oh, yeah, people people are bringing this up. That's right. It said character pack. Um, I was too busy looking at the, the green minis and, and the rectangle box. This is a brand new thing. Character packs have never been done in the United system. I am so curious, and I really hope they talk about this on the live stream on Friday. I asked Andrea Hiervesio, the designer, on the Facebook group about it, but he's a busy guy, I understand. I, I didn't hear anything. The size of this box, I don't think it's going to be as small as everybody thinks it is, because it's got to fit five miniatures and then all these cards. And you might be able to do that with tiny miniatures, like they fit all the pets in a small box, in the pet companions box, but these guys aren't pets. These are normal sized people and Kilowog is a big dude. So I don't know what kind of box we're looking at here, but somebody has mentioned, and I think that this is the best possible sort of outcome here, is that this is small, but if you take another box of the same size and sort of stack it right on top of it, then they are the same size as a normal square box. So it's the same width of a United box, but it's shorter. It's sort of like one cut in half lengthwise. And I think I'm okay with that. But then the whole character pack of it all, that is unprecedented. And now, as many, many other people have been speculating, that opens a lot of doors, folks. And I don't think we can understate that enough, just how many doors it opens. It is opening Monsters, Inc. levels of doors. Because if this character pack sets the precedent that we think it does, we're going to see more of these that are not full expansions, but just these smaller character boxes throughout this campaign and throughout possible future Marvel United uh, reveals. Because of the fact that so many people have said that Marvel United doesn't have enough left in it, you know, not enough steam to carry a whole season, I disagree. And I think a lot of other people disagree. But a lot of folks have noted, you know, we would be not scraping the bottom of the barrel with a season four, but we would be getting close to the bottom. So in lieu of a full season, Perhaps a Kickstarter, or not Kickstarter rather, but a game found campaign of just, I don't know, 10 of these, 12 of these might be the next best thing. And it might be what they're going for. Personally, I always thought that if they don't do a full season four of Marvel, I thought it would just be best if they just did a sort of big, gigantic stretch goal box that just makes up the bulk of all the characters we're missing and that's it. No season, no expansion boxes, no this, no that. Just a big, chunky box of characters just for the longtime Marvel United fans to get if they want kind of thing. But maybe people don't want all those characters. Maybe Simon understands that. I'm the kind of guy who would love to have everybody, but not everybody is. So this gives them the option to pick and choose who they'd like. Now, in a perfect world, you could customize your own box, but I get it. They can't do that. But this is a great idea, and it has me really excited. So excited that it almost overshadows the final reveal of the next hero to be teed up for unlocking, which is Katana. My favorite member of... I think she was on the Suicide Squad. She was in the movie, at least. She was my favorite member of the Suicide Squad in that movie. And she's got a great origin story, too, where 
She was a skilled martial artist who eventually married a loving husband and gave birth to a pair of twins. However, her brother-in-law grew jealous of their relationship and challenged her husband to a duel with Tatsu as the prize. That's her. She's Tatsu. This duel would lead to the death of her family, and she would use the very sword that took their life to avenge them. Now she wields that sword, Soul Taker, to eradicate all injustice from this world. What a great origin. Awesome character. And there she is. There's her miniature. Oh, she's standing on a little, uh, little wooden bridge. And there are her cards. Soul Taker Sword. Defeat up to two thugs in your location. Yeah, that's a really powerful sword. They nailed her symbol on her card, too. And what it says about her here, Katana's traumatic life experiences have sharpened her skills as well as her blade, which is said to capture the souls of its victims. Ooh, she's got to team up with Ghost Rider. Wielding Soul Taker, she easily mows down multiple thugs surrounding her. Or, if she's alone with her foe, she can deliver a strike straight to the heart that can finish off the toughest of villains. Katana's experiences also made her a natural protector, so even as she's about to be KO'd, she can flip her starting card to rescue a couple of civilians anywhere. And there we have it. I am recording this um, early in the evening, just because I can't record any later, unfortunately. And let's see here. If we jump over to the project, we are at 1,054,000. Okay. And Katana will be unlocked at 1,060,000. So by the time I upload this video, uh, we may very well have katana it probably won't finish uploading till very late tonight or very early tomorrow morning but uh we'll be looking down the barrel of another villain at that time if the pattern goes right there we have it that is all we have gotten so far all right and as i was finishing uh recording and doing all that stuff uh they reached the threshold and they unlocked katana and now we are waiting to unlock uh, a team deck of atlantis heroes and at first i got really excited because i thought does that mean we're seeing Aqua Lad? But no, the team deck says it's specifically built just for Aquaman and Mira. Just a little deck that helps them work in tandem even more. They they really want uh, the Aquaman characters to stick together, apparently. But uh, that should hopefully not take too long to unlock because it is just a team deck after all. And then we'll be staring down the barrel of a villain next. So I'm excited to see what happens. And of course... You can join us right back here in a couple days uh, as we talk about what ends up inevitably being revealed on Friday's live stream, because that's probably going to leave a mark as well. So until then, my friends, I will see you next time here on Digital Charcuterie, where we continue to make the wait for Marvel United Multiverse a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. See you next time.